we fear it. An agent of flaming destruction. An enemy to be vanquished at all costs. Yet fire is an integral element in this landscape. An agent of procreation. Without it, the bush would not be the bush as we know it. It's our presence that has disturbed the balance that time evolved between fire and the land. We either cause too much fire, or paradoxically, too little. The bush needs the right fire at the right time. Too often, the changes we wrought make for the wrong fire at the wrong time. This fire came at the wrong time. It started as a control fire that got out of control. Fire was set to burn off the accumulated undergrowth and forest litter called fuel. The control burn turned into a wildfire that's now jumped the headwaters of the Murray and the border into Victoria. The Victorian Forests Commission has established a forward command post to orchestrate tactics and strategy. Now, there's been no backburning in there. The fire is in here. I'll draw it in. Yeah. Roughly in here. It's warfare. Though yeah, fighting a fire that is advancing unpredictably here, yeah. and on any number of fronts is guerrilla warfare rather than a set piece battle. Uh, back forward, yes, I've been here all the bloody time I've been watching. There's only four of us Corio on those two. Kevin Carlisle's going in the middle of the boat. Hey, four Corio on. Five there. Well, who's the, what's the fifth doing? The fourth is on the little boat, John Deere, Kevin Carlisle. He's down along there, though. He's in that section. He's on that section, yeah, I believe. AB Mobile 2, AB Mobile 2 from AD5 base, AD5 base, do you read? The story of this fire and how it is fought contains many of the elements of what is a complex and vexing problem. How to manage fire to protect human needs while serving those of the bush. One of the elements is firefighting techniques in the conditions peculiar to Australia. Rugged and inaccessible terrain, highly flammable material built up rapidly through gums shedding great quantities of leaves and lower branches, hot dry winds and no water. The objective is simple enough. Stop the fire as quickly as possible. So are some of the methods. Rough and ready, not much changed from the first days of white settlement. The first line of defence remains manpower. A platoon armed with a simple but effective weapon, the rake hoe. It chops on one side, rakes with the other, and is used to cut a break in the vegetation. It works as long as the flames don't get too high and jump the break. Birds patrol the fire front and the newly cleared breaks for insects and other small animal refugees. Though sometimes the birds themselves, the younger and smaller ones, fall victim to the smoke and flames. The effect of different types of fire on the wildlife should be another element in the way we decide to manage fire. In the natural scheme of things, the regeneration triggered by fire helps to maintain a diversity of habitat. Though it might kill individual animals, enough survive in unburnt patches to recolonize the area. If through human efforts, for instance, fire is kept out of an area too long, the resultant build-up of fuel means that when fire does break out, it's so intense that nothing will escape. The Forestry Commission's John Morrow, who's running this fire, knows all about fuel. This is very heavy uh, litter through here, all these bark and leaves that accumulate from year to year. These trees are the alpine ash, although locally they're called woolly butt because of the fibrous bark. Fire will readily run up the trunks of those. This a uh, bush here that's been knocked down with snow damage. We've got a lot of this sort of thing throughout the bush. This, this creates an elevated aerial fuel, you might say, and uh, fire will run up through this as well. In the extreme, it can run right up the top and rip the crowns out of the trees. Oh, 
doesn't look near as formidable now as it uh, did when I was here last time. I went up along this track to the next spur and uh, I could see the fire developing, running up the spur and uh, I could see there was no hope of uh, getting out of its way. I thought I'll go back to the spot here that I knew and I got about halfway across and the fire jumped over here. I came down here and I hopped in this water hole here. I'm not going to hop in now, but right up to my neck in water. Had all nice and wet to protect me from the heat. It was only a few minutes elapsed and the fire converged and there were great balls of yellow orange flame through here, followed by a dense cloud of black smoke. More yellow flame. And I waited here quite for some time. I don't know how long before the main effect of the fire went past. Once the fire jumped the river on day one, a strong north wind pushed it out on a number of fronts. Though John Morrow had seen it coming and taken his precautions, there's nothing that will stop a wildfire on the run. In the next two days, it burnt through 10,000 hectares of forest. One factor that makes fighting a fire in Australia different from anywhere else is the way our fires send out advanced raiding parties. Sparks, burning streamers of bark and the like, carried by the winds and convection currents and starting spot fires far ahead of the main front. Torches of bark can travel 20 kilometres and more. Hollow, dead trees are an especial hazard. As they burn like a chimney and then topple, they send out a continuous stream of sparks for the wind to carry to the forest ahead. They can also harbour fire to rekindle the flames after the fire has moved through. Manpower is not enough to contain the enemy and machinery is brought in to clear a break wide enough to stop the highest flames. Bulldozers are the heavy artillery in this war. As well as cutting breaks quickly, they're used to carve access tracks. The gashes they leave in the bush become the lesser of two evils. The Forest Commission, severely criticised for its handling of the disastrous fires of 1939, today sees its brief as simple and clear. Protect human life and property and forest resources, and that means stopping any fires by the most effective means as quickly as possible. It's a policy that sometimes leaves it at loggerheads with conservationists. The advance is stopped on this front, for the moment at least. Towards evening of the third day, the wind dies down. The fire is left without its strongest ally, and the opposing force of men and machines has its best chance for a counter-attack. The weapon brought into action is fire itself. Fighting fire with fire is the oldest and still the most widely used tactic in the Australian bush. In inexperienced hands, it can be a dangerous and destructive weapon but it's the only one that's got a chance against a fast-moving forest fire. The process is called backburning, and the principle is the same as that involved in clearing a firebreak. Deny the advancing fire fuel, and it will go out. The fire bosses prefer to conduct their backburns at night, when the winds have died down and conditions are more stable and therefore more controllable. The amount of bush put to the flame is carefully controlled so as to keep the fire at the right intensity. Neither so much as to pose the danger of its getting out of control, nor so little as to leave unburnt fuel to feed the advancing main fire. Men with rake hose and bulldozers patrol the perimeter to keep the backburn within the designated areas.
Dead trees that catch a light become chimneys spewing sparks and must be quickly cut down before they can fall outside the backbone boundary and start unwanted fires. While there's general agreement that often the only way to stop fire is with a backburn like this one, another use of fire is the subject of much debate. That is the practice of burning off accumulated fuel at safe times of the year. Though there is a consensus that the bush needs regular doses of fire to maintain its equilibrium, there are conflicting opinions on how those doses should be administered, in what quantity and on what scale. One problem is that not enough is known about the precise effects of fire on the bush. Current practice is to put control fires through every five to seven years, based on the rate of fuel accumulation. It will take many years of study to measure the long-term ecological effects of any control firing pattern. In the meantime, there is already evidence that forests that once were park-like woodlands are being turned into impenetrable scrub because frequent fires promote the rapid growth of some plants at the expense of others. Less fire-resistant plant species may be wiped out in favour of hardier ones, with consequent effects on the entire makeup of the forest. Though there is a greater awareness among foresters of the need to adapt firefighting techniques to varying conditions, and the need to include the impact on the bush in their considerations, their first responsibility remains the protection of human settlement. The legacy of 1939 still weighs heavily. The work goes on through the night. At dawn, a new shift will take over. The fire is run like a military operation, with everything organized down to the last signpost. Reports being fed into the communications network build up into a grim picture. The fire is spreading on a number of fronts, faster than the efforts to contain it can be marshalled. Reinforcements are brought in from around the state. Experienced forestry workers supported by rural fire brigade volunteers. Central headquarters in Melbourne marshals the resources and charts the fire's progress. It provides an overview that the tactics are left to the fire boss on the scene. The dots mark the fires, the arrows the wind direction. The reality they represent is a fire that rages virtually out of control. It's day four and the fire is burning on a 15 kilometer front, fanned by strong winds. The opposing force has grown to 150 men, supported by five bulldozers, 14 water tankers, 15 four-wheel drive vehicles and a helicopter, with another large force operating on the New South Wales side of the border. Chemical weapons are called in. Plane is loaded with Foschek, a fire retardant. The smoke clears long enough to allow the pilot to see where he's going, and the plane takes off for its bombing run. The target is a spot fire that the men on the ground are having trouble containing. The Foschek won't stop it, but they hope will slow it for long enough to enable the ground crew to get it under control. The 
way the fire is traveling can be a decisive factor. The chemical has more chance of taking effect if the fire is traveling downhill, which it does slowly, rather than uphill, which it does fast. In the meantime, the main fire continues its advance, and the men in charge are forced to resort to a technique they prefer to avoid, backburning by day. Daytime, with its heat and fickle winds, means less chance of being able to keep the backburn in check. The chance must be taken, and a helicopter is armed with a type of large match, DADES, short for Delayed Action Incendiary Devices. At the same time, the traditional weapons continue to be used. Axes and machetes to cut breaks around the more accessible parts of the fronts. Helicopters or light planes are also used increasingly to start control burns to reduce fuel. It's quicker, cheaper and more efficient than having to do the same job with ground crews. The difficulty of keeping fuel reduction burns within the required limits of extent and intensity is one of the major misgivings conservationists have about the deliberate use of fire. A sudden change in wind strength or direction, for example, can quickly produce more fire than planned. Aerial burning reduces some of that risk by enabling quick advantage to be taken of the right conditions. The technique is the same as that used here to create a backburn. The low-flying helicopter follows a predetermined grid pattern along which the incendiary devices are dropped at timed intervals. With control burns, the idea is to burn up the built fuel at a steady and controlled rate. With a backburn like this one, the aim is to have the area burnt out as quickly as possible, so that the main fire, when it arrives, has nothing to feed on. The mosaic of smoke tells the story. The backburn is going to plan, and there's now a good chance the fire will be halted on this front at least. And I think the centre's going to be the best point to lift. Fire has the advantage in this terrain. For the men and machines, movement is cumbersome and fraught with risk. One of the trucks has crashed over a makeshift bridge during the night. The men got out without being hurt, and the truck is still operational too, as soon as it can be got back on its wheels. Frequently, accidents exact a heavier toll in machines and sometimes lives. A bulldozer is brought in to cut a new track and pull out the truck. Special access roads often have to be cut to get to a fire. And if, like this one, it proves not safe enough, it is a simple operation to construct another. Ironically, though, the tracks created to help fight fires later often help cause them by allowing increased public access. It's estimated that more than three quarters of the forest fires started in Victoria in an average year are caused by human carelessness. Lightning is the other main cause, something like 16%, which can go up to 28% in a bad year. The year of this fire was bad enough, in the previous week alone, 66 fires broke out in this mountain region. The road is clear and the column of men and machinery moves on to another front. If 
you ever forget it's tough terrain to work in, you're likely to get reminded soon enough. Even the ace drivers who boast that they can make their machines dance or roll a cigarette can suddenly find themselves sitting where they shouldn't be, in their dozer making tracks in the air. <coughs> Actually, I was um, down around the side of the hill pushing all the um, dry trees and uh, things that were burning, and I pushed one tree in, uh, down, and I was back and round to push another one, and uh, the top track went up on a little log, just enough to lift me up onto a, the sapling so big, and the top track just hit it in the she went. The casualties mount, but the war is being won. The fire has been contained on all fronts except this one. A break has been almost completed, but the fire is approaching so fast it becomes a race for the bulldozer to finish clearing the break before the flames arrive. The crucial task is to bring down an old and dead hollow tree that would act as a fire torch were it to catch a light and fall across the road. Attempts to push it over fail, so the driver fixes a chain to try The brake has been cut across the slope to stop the fire's uphill rush. There's a risk its onward momentum will carry it across into the bush on the other side. But the brake holds. Though branches high up in some trees catch a light, the strong draught created by the fire carries burning leaves and shreds of bark across the brake and a spot fire flares. Seconds count. There's a frantic dash to beat the flames before they can get a runaway hold on the dry undergrowth. Anchor from one of the local volunteer fire brigades helps make sure every last spark is extinguished. Smoke still hangs over the battlefield, but it seems the war is won, and the fire has been controlled on all fronts and has mostly burnt itself out. All that remains is the mopping up. Fire lays traps, leaves remnants to smolder deep inside hollow logs and down among the roots. Undetected, they can smolder for weeks, sometimes months, to flare up again on a windy day. So while the first of the timber trucks are already moving out of the logging areas, squads of firefighters quarter the fire-ravaged ground, extinguishing every last ember. And while the men mop up, the reckoning begins. Half a million hectares of forest burnt in the five days since the fire jumped the river. Man hours, machine hours, costing the fighting of this fire will take weeks. The immediate cost to the bush can also be calculated fairly accurately. So many animals killed, so many trees will eventually rise from seeds germinating in the ashes, watered by the rain that comes to the rescue of John Morrow and his men. Thunder, it's raining. No more mop up and patrol. That'll do us. Unless the thunder and lightning starts it all off and we've got to get into it again. It's the long-term effects that are unknown. How much of a contribution this fire will make to the long-term impact of man and his methods of fire management? It is reasonably certain that the bush will survive, but it may do so in a form very different from the one we know or want.
This tree's sending out a survival response already. Here's some brand new leaves. <laughs> 